surface with Bob. Welcome, everybody. This is Breakfast with Bob. My name is Bob Babbitt. We're brought to you by the PTO, the Pro Triathletes Organization, by Amp Human, VeloFix, Normatec, Form Swim Goggles, You Can, and our Challenged Athletes Foundation. We just sent out 3,921 grants, totaling $5.9 million to keep challenged athletes in the game of life through sport. One of those athletes who's one of our favorite people on the planet and is the world record holder for the marathon for double amputees. His name is Marco Cesetto, 237.23 at Chicago Marathon last year. Marco, how are you doing? I am doing pretty good, Bob. Thank you for having me. Always a pleasure, Marco. So, growing up in Kenya, obviously a running culture. Were you a runner from being a little boy? I was a runner being a little boy, but running to get some stuff, go to school, running was part of a lifestyle. I didn't do it just because I knew it was going to help me be a runner in the future. I was just using it as a means. Were you, were you guys running in shoes? You were running barefoot? What was it? Everybody hears the Kenyan guys, they run 10K to school in the morning, they run home for lunch, they run back, and then they run 10K home every day barefoot. What's, what's the truth? Yeah, it is true that we're barefoot. And if we and even if you had some shoes, it was one pair. So you would have to take them off if it was muddy, run to school carrying your shoes, and as closer you get to the school, you just put them on and go to class. So then you would save your shoes and make them last longer. You can always grow your food cells, but you can't grow your soul from your shoe if it wore out and you went to i think two years of like a junior college um and then you were recruited to go to university of alaska anchorage and before you left to go to to alaska what did you know about alaska nothing i knew nothing about alaska not even where it was on the map and what did your parents need to do to get the money to travel? It's one thing to get a scholarship, but you still have to get from Kenya to Alaska. Yes, and the process of becoming an, a student in the U.S. is not, you know, the school gives you the scholarship, but you have to cover the government part. The Homeland Security fee, called the service fee, you have to pay for embassy fee, you have to pay for your ticket, and that's a lot of money. So my dad had to sell his shop and some of these animals to be able to send me home. Wow, that big sacrifice by your parents to get you there. And remember, my dad doesn't have one kid. This guy had 20 of us. Wait, 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 20 kids? Yes, two wives. So my mom had 11 and the other one had nine. So 20 kids, 15 boys and five girls. Oh my God, when you guys sat down to dinner, I, was it what, the, the person who was most aggressive actually got food? It was how quick you could get the food from the table to your mouth to your belly. Like that was that would determine how much food you would eat. How quick can you get it, put it in your mouth, and swallow it? So the competition there was probably tougher than any race you've ever been in. Oh yeah, way tougher because the nice thing about the organized sport racing is they tell you it starts at this time and they have a countdown and all that structured and you would have somebody to complain to. But this one was so informal that they didn't even have somebody to complain to. So when you get to Alaska, and again, you grow up in a very warm, humid climate, what was the, what was the first surprise for you? Because I'm sure when you first got there in September or August, the weather's pretty nice. When did you start understanding that Alaska's a little different? Uh, around November of 2008, when it kind of looked like it was going to rain, but then some white stuff started falling from the sky. And I was like, this is kind of different. It was not even dusty. You will get wet. And that was my first time knowing how snow is formed. My previous thoughts were not what was actually happening in real time. So did you have the type of clothes to keep you warm or were you totally unprepared? I did, but even with 
the clothes that they say these are winter clothes it was so cold that nothing would make it, make it remotely warm <laughs> so you had success right ncaa west region champion 2009 2010 all american 2008 9 and 10 uh male athlete of the year 2008 9 and 10 so, but you also were talking to friends and family back home and saying that you, obviously you were enjoying yourself. And your cousin William, when did he come over? He came in 2010. Okay. And how was he running? Was he running well when he got there? Oh, yeah, he was running well. He was a good resource. He was a talent to be developed. He was running well. And so, doing, yeah. Doing and he's doing well in school, too. But there's, yes. sometimes it's tough dealing with the fact that when you get into November, December, it gets, it's dark for pretty much most of the day. Was, was that hard for William? Is that, what was his, what were his struggles? At the moment, or then, in 2011, when, you know, he committed suicide, right. you know, there was no way of knowing maybe this was what had happened. Because prior to that, we didn't have anything to say. How is, we didn't have a benchmark to say, how is everyone doing? So we were all just having fun in our mid twenties, some were on early twenties, you know, and everything was okay. But then after he died, we started looking back and the changes that we had not put a lot of emphasis or attention to prior to that and realized there's a lot of changes between summer and winter and maybe some factors could have contributed like the weather or some other things that he was going in life but it's usually pretty tough transition to go from Kenya to Alaska but then Alaska has it, so many seasons in one day you can have all the seasons in Alaska it could be snowy sunny rainy everything windy all that so when, but there was a point, so before William committed suicide, he had called you and wanted to get together to talk. Yes. And, but by the time you got there, he had committed suicide. How, did you take that, was that something that you internalized and felt I should have done more? Yes, I, yes, I did. Because, you know, we, we all, even, uh, you know, we all encourage people, hey, if you are feeling down, if you have something, call someone right and at that point i felt like he really tried he in my mind i know i was telling myself that he didn't want to do this because he was trying to reach out to me to talk he wanted some help and me not knowing that he must have or he was going through what he must have been going through i didn't think there was an urgency to leave what i was doing and head out to go talk to him. In fact, I gave him a good advice. I thought it was a good advice. I said, go and finish your English assignment. He had a English writing assignment. I said, go finish your assignment. It's Friday today. And then we will have tonight and the whole of tomorrow, I will be free to, and then we can talk. But that never materialized. So that oh. ate into me so much. So you were dealing, that was in February of yep. uh, uh of 2011 right and then so were you on medication for depression through all of this uh by like towards the mid to the end of march yeah i it took me down really quick i was starting to be on uh, you know i was given antidepressant right and like april of that year i remember that was I was first hospitalized for an overdose in April 1, I think. And I was in the hospital for 28 days. Wow. Did you feel when you came out of the hospital that you had dealt with it or was it still there, still lingering? Yes, I, I felt that I had dealt with it pretty well. But there's one point that I always share with people about mental health. And the idea that it's just an illness that you can get over with having not being able to talk with, about it freely like i do now i can you can ask me anything about mental health or what i went through 
And today I can explain it to you so well. But then there was a lot of stigma to it. It was yes. a sign this is a weakness. And even if I say something, what are people going to do? How are they going to help me? So I took it upon myself. And so when I got out, because on those 28 days I had therapy, which really helped me. But then when that was not there, I went back to depression. But I didn't talk about it. I just kept it to myself. Well, you probably figured if I'm running and doing and going to class and I'm busy, that I can just sort of keep that depression in the background. But then you get to the point, November 6, 2011, you go out for a run. And what happened? I had taken a month, another dose of antidepressants, and I don't even know how many, and went for a run. The only thing that I remember from that day was when I woke up and I was in the middle of the snow, like I was covered in snow. And I kind of was wondering where I was. I could see the light from the moon. It was very bright. And I was very hot. Like I was, I wanted to take my clothes off when I just realized where I was. And how long had you been out there? I didn't realize how long I had been out there. I thought maybe this was just maybe like what, a, I'm still on my run and maybe something just happened until I walked into a hotel lobby and that's where a worker who was working at the hotel asked me where I had been for three days. More than 56 hours. Three days? Yes. So the fact that you're alive is unbelievable. And when they got you to the hospital, what was the diagnosis at that point? It was severe frostbite. And when I got to the hospital, I thought my hands were the ones that were badly damaged because of the pain that I was feeling. It was the most painful thing I've ever felt. But when the doctor asked me about my feet and I said, my feet are okay because there is no pain, that was when he said, uh, that's not a good sign. Pain is always a sign of life. And that is what has been pushing me even in my running. I'm like, oh, it's getting painful, but it's pain. But remember, this is a sign of life. Pain is good. Yes. <laughs> when they made the decision that they needed to amputate your legs, what was your reaction? I honestly went numb. Even though I had seen in the four or five days that I was in the hospital that my feet were starting to decomposed, it's starting to fall off, like it looked like my nails were falling off. But, you know, you still have the hope that, you know, a miracle will happen. But then when they said we are going to amputate your feet, I really didn't know what to tell myself. And there was nothing that I really told myself, actually. I was just numb and I said, you know, okay. But not really an okay that I really wanted my feet to be amputated. But the next phase was the hardest one. I decided I wanted to let my dad know because while I was in the hospital, you know, my friends were showing me how the news were all over that I was found and, you know, it's all over the globe. And I said, I don't want my parents to be surprised just reading it on the news that their son has lost their feet. And I was more concerned about my mom. Yeah. So I called my dad and I told my dad they are going to amputate my feet below the knee tomorrow. But I don't want you to tell mom. I will be the one to tell her. But I want you to know that is what is happening and just, I'll be fine. And it was, it went silent for like almost five minutes. Like my dad didn't say anything and I kind of tried to check if we had a disconnection. I said, no, I'm still here. And I said, okay, you have anything you want to tell me? They said, no. And then he hanged up. And then you had a, after the operation, you called your mom? No, after, no, I didn't call my mom. After the operation, you know, of course, the news was an amputation. And I called my mom and, I say, and then he said, she said, hey, how are you? You know, I am told you had frostbite. And I said, I'm doing good. They are now, you know, I had to craft a message that was comforting, but not very assuring at the same time. 
I was trying not to tell my mom the, to- the whole story, but I also didn't want to tell her that something was good and it was not. So I told her, you know, maybe I might lose a few toes here and there, maybe below the angle. And I mean, I'll be fine. Because I, my goal was my mom reaction and feeling will be better if she could see me yeah. physically rather than me talking and hard thinking, maybe I'm taking this to just make her happy. And I organized for them to come to the US, but my mom didn't want to fly. So she's like, I'm not coming, I'm not flying. So my dad came over and then we took some videos and my dad took them back. And you know, it, it, it was comforting that my mom took it positively and said, you know, I'm happy. And I've seen that you lost your feet below the knee, but I'm okay. As long as you're doing good, I'm good. I said, mom, do you want me to come back to Kenya? She told me something really interesting. She said, in life, good things and bad things can happen to you anywhere. There is no specific place for good things or bad things. It can be anywhere. So it's up to you. If you feel like you will feel better coming home, you can come home. I'm always welcoming you back home. But if you still feel like America is your place, then I have no problem with that. So after William passed, you were on depression medication. Did you need to go on depressants, the depression, uh, depression meds after you had your legs amputated? They, the doctors wanted to keep me on antidepressants. Yeah. But something really strange, it was a peculiar experience. After my amputation, like two days maybe, I felt better inside me, you know, something in me told me I was doing okay. But I was in denial on that good feeling to say, you know, you just lost your feet and you're telling yourself you are feeling better. This is your head going really crazy. But it was after my amputation that I realized, you know, if you truly had control over things in life, like your cousin and all that, would it be yourself? Would you have, would you have prevented you are fit from being amputated and all that, then I realized, you know, some things in life just happens and we don't have control over. So that really helped me. And I said, and I don't think I need antidepressants. I started, and this is not a medical advice. I am no, not no. a medical professional. This was me, you know, assessing my situation and telling myself, you know, I've never had any mental issues. It was just a tragic event in my life, and then I'm on this medication. And it felt like my situation wasn't after I was on antidepressants. So I just took a cold turkey on antidepressants and stopped taking them. It was not easy, but after 21 whatever days, I felt okay. And from that point, after I just stopped, I never took them. When did you realize that you could still be a runner? that even though you didn't have legs, that there was other ways to run? You know, when, and when I was still at the hospital, my friends visited me a lot of, and you know, this was 2011. Right. The 2012 Paralympics, Olympics was coming. In London. The infamous South African Oscar Pistorius was a hot kick then. So a lot of friends came with his videos and showed me this, look, this is a guy from your continent, Africa. He's running like nobody else, and he doesn't even have feet. And it was my first time actually seeing somebody on prosthetics. I even had a gentleman, he was 80 years old then, who was uh, bilateral below me, who walked to my hospital bed and said, oh, you know, he was just kind of like teasing me on my situation. And I said, this guy is just the meanest person I've ever seen met in my life but then he just pulled up his pants and he didn't have legs and I look I was just trying to show you that you still will do whatever you want it's like I drive my truck I do all the things that I used to do prior to losing my legs and that was when I knew I could still run so you sent me video right before the the interview of you running for the first time in your OSER flex runs in 2013 that you received from Challenge Athletes Foundation. And that was in 2013. What was that feeling like to be running again? It was, and that was the day, you know, I had a hoodie you could see from the video. And I started sweating. 
And I didn't remember the last time that I was sweating running and that was the greatest feeling in my life. I knew that if I can swear that means I am doing something. And I knew from that day, it was May 23rd of 2013. And I knew, yes, this is going to go down again. And I would be running very soon. So when did you, uh, first, I think you were thinking Paralympics, right? Because you'd watched Oscar Pistorius, but in the Paralympics, they only have 100, 200, and 400 for, 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 ampute for double amputees. Um, and for you, you're a long distance guy. How long did it take you to make the decision? I'm not gonna stay on the track. I I'm gonna go run long. It was after the 2016, Paralympics. Thing, then I was still a Kenyan citizen. Right. And so the Kenyan National Paralympics had their issues and we couldn't, I couldn't go to Rio, even though I had met the provisional monks that would have taken me to Rio. But then at the same time, during that time that I was to travel to Rio, my wife was scheduled for a C-section. Yes. And I was five years old now. I missed her delivery because I was in drug relays in Iowa. So I had this dilemma of, do I need to go stay? So part of that decision not to go to Rio, one was because of the Kenyan National Paralympics. And then the idea that my wife was going to have a C-section. So. Even though I missed going to Rio, there was a good reason for me to convince myself that, you know what, I missed it, but there is also an important event in my life that happened, my kid. Exactly, the most important. So what, what was your first marathon? Uh, New York City. It was after that that I decided, you know what, I want to go back to marathon. I am getting up there. I'm not 20 anymore. I really want to do something that I love. I want to run marathons. So I, you know, I've been coming to Orlando for my prosthetics. So I talked with my prosthetist, Stan. I said, Stan, I want to, long, to run long distance. He said, yes, but for you to do that, we have to get you down here to Orlando. I said, I've never read anywhere that there is a good marathon from Orlando. Maybe I've not done a lot of research, but okay. And the reason was running on prosthetics, there's a lot of issues associated with it all the time. And it made sense for me to like, yes, it would be ideal for me to optimize my training to be closer to where if anything needs to be fixed, I would get it fixed right away. So we moved, we drove from Anchorage, Alaska to Orlando, Florida, 5,000 miles. And that was June 15 was when we finally met down to Orlando and I started training. A few, probably a month later after we moved, someone texts me, says, you're running New York Marathon. You know, that's when you know you have your crazy friends. Like, okay, how am I going to run New York City Marathon? I've not even trained for it. I'm going back, I'm in my head first, I'm going, Bob, do you really want me to run? New York City man. But then in me, I've had this thing in life that, you know, my mom told us, I don't want you guys to try something just because it doesn't work. But I want you to try it so that you know how to make it work. I said, well, okay, I'm going to run this. Not because it's going to be my awesome marathon, but this is going to be my first marathon that I would use to train for my next good one. And, and that, you got me to New York. and that was That's my right. Favorite. And you ran sub three hours in your first marathon. 252. <laughs> so right then, I mean, at that point, you're 10 minutes off of Richard Whitehead's record, which was 242, right? And when you finished that marathon, I bet you knew right away, I can go way faster than this. Oh, I even like, yes, halfway through, even though I had not finished it, yeah, I know. I am struggling right now because I have not done the marathon stuff 
I just came from driving 5,000 miles to Orlando and I'm running New York Marathon. I knew then that yes, I still had the energy that would push me faster than I was running New York Marathon. And after New York, what was, was the next one Chicago? Yes, the next one was Chicago. But then, and you know, and my wife, she's always pushing me. She's like, but you know, Chicago is a long way to, why don't you go and run Boston? I said, oh, yeah. but at the same time, we're just having some financial issues after, you know, having moved, you know, like, oh, right. well, maybe. But then a few days later, uh, Marla, the- Marla Runyon. Yes. Boston Marathon. Text me and said, hey, what do you think? We wanted to bring you to come and run Boston Marathon so that, that we can use you and your story to announce our 2020 para section. I said, awesome, I would do it because I was kind of debating, well, financially, I would, maybe I might not be able to afford it. And I went and the morning of the race, I got an email that says, the weather condition might be extreme for, for para athletes. You have until seven o'clock to decide and scratch and I'm going, you know what? You flew from Orlando to Boston anyway. Why would you just scratch like an hour before going to the start line? I think I'm gonna go there. I've dealt with more challenging things than this. I go there and perfect day. I'm running and like my 22, I looked at my time and I said, no way. I think I'm within the margin of breaking that it was 2.42 time. Yep. And, and 2.42.24. Yes. <laughs> and how did that, well, all of a sudden, you get that world record. Is that when the Nike sponsorship came in? It didn't come right away. It was closer to going to Chicago. It was maybe like a month to Chicago that the Nike sponsorship came in. So then you go back to Chicago, and yeah. <laughs> that was the perfect day. It was. It was a perfect day. It's, you know, the start line was just right there. It was not a long, you know, everything just went right. It was a little bit windy, just a little windy, but it was okay. So when you ran Boston, you were 141 pounds. When you ran Chicago, you were 135. And yes. you ran, you ended up running 237.23 and didn't just break your record, you shattered your record. What was the feeling like coming across that finish line knowing you're doing things no amputee has ever done before? Running in the 230s is a double amputee. What was going through your mind? You know, I realized at that point that really it's what you tell yourself. There's no other miracle in things that you can achieve in life. It's what you always tell yourself. Because from the word go, we, you know, you, you even remember we had an email correspondent between me, you, uh, Richard Whitehead, and Brooke from OSA. We were talking about, oh, this record is going to, and I had that confidence that, yes, I think I have this. Telling myself that built a lot of confidence in me. And actually doing it in Chicago made me just affirm that, yes, it's what you tell yourself. Because you can even convince yourself not to be able to do the most simplest thing, and it will be very challenging in life. But then the other thing that really, really struck, or that came to my mind then too was, I am sure there's a kid out there that was struggling like I did, not knowing what to do. Would I go to the Paralympics and run the 400, even, not, even though it's not my event, or I venture my own new sport? Create your own sport and do it. People would just support you on your way. So I thought that was a good opportunity and a learning moment for all the other amputees who are out there and not knowing what to actually do. To me, me running that would help someone say, you know what? I can do whatever sport they want. I can do my running and create my own competitive event myself. It doesn't, 
we always have this say that say somebody needs to do something. You can be that someone. Just like you thought about helping your friend who was injured to be back in sport and look at the movement that you created. Had you waited and said, somebody needs to do something for my friend. Maybe that somebody would not have been there and we wouldn't have a beneficiary like myself bragging about running 237, but also crediting Challenged Athlete Foundation. There's, I even, you've connected me to my training partner too, my Polar Watch. I don't have a training partner. I train with my watch. I'm always with my watch. So I think as an athlete, as a human being, it's what is in you. Go with what the good things that you're thinking about and pursue them. It will change you and someone else's life too. After you broke the world record uh, that second time in Chicago, how did your life change or did it? It did. My life changed in so many ways. One, Boston. After I ran that Boston, it opened a door for me to get Nike sponsorship. Yeah. And that meant I had the financial um, means to train better for my next resident. It meant that my family would depend on what I was doing too. It's, become, it's becoming a life earning, just a running. Additionally, I am using the platform to share my story on possibilities. There is so much potential in us and the opportunities are out there. It will not come to your house, Bob, and ring a doorbell and say, hey, an opportunity is here. We have to go out there and seek for that opportunity. You are the best. It is always so much fun chatting with you. So what's next? I mean, obviously we have to wait for marathons to come back, but how fast do you think you can go? Oh, I'm still, I'm still hoping my next marathon, except for your advice though, I have, my goal is to run a sub 230 marathon. I am yeah. at 37. And knowing that you secretly told me, the secret would be run the seven marathon and break record in all those seven. So I have seven marathons to run a sub 230. But I think my next marathon for sure would be comfortably running a 235 with all what's going on. You're becoming smart. The idea is, you don't want to break your record by five or 10 minutes. You want to break it by five seconds and then yeah. do it again. And then do it again. <laughs> we, call that, we call that the Sergei Bubka. He was this pole vaulter from Russia. And every time he'd break a world record, be by like a 10th of an inch. And he'd get big prize money every time. Yes. I love that. So uh, when you look back, at the lowest moment of your life and the highest moment of your life. What, what, what fits into those two categories for you? You know, I realized in life, there are challenges and opportunities. And the order in which it might hit you, there is no order. You can start with being the most successful person in life and then all of a sudden get hit by a tragedy. And then, or you can start with a tragedy and end up with a lot of opportunities. It doesn't really matter what hits you first. It's readiness and training our minds that part of life is opportunities, challenges, tragedies, gratitude, grace, kindness, all those together makes us who we are. My story might sound like a tragic story or story of a great comeback, but every person has those stories. It's only that we've never had everyone on video to tell us their stories. So when you, we've been obviously working together with you and CAF 
for well seven eight years now what's your favorite caf moment oh man not triathlon in san diego and, and what, you, what makes I, that special you know the first time when i came in 2013 or maybe 14, I'm not very sure, around that year, those two years, um, I felt like I was the only different person in Alaska all, all the time. And I had a feeling of me and, you know, my life has been limited because of my amputation. Came to CAF Foundation. And the most inspiring part are small children. These guys have the greatest smile on their faces but physically you can see the most challenging conditions they are going through in their lives but they are still smiling that motivated me in all aspects of my life I, every time i feel like i have something that is pushing me down i just flash back to the caf event and i'm like no Remember those kids. I saw one kid, maybe she's an adult now. She was missing both hands and she was able. She was just talking to someone on the phone and I'm like, look at that. And they were laughing with that person. And I'm like, look at that. Just see that. But then at the same time, their happiness came from the idea that there was somebody, there were people that cared about them and they were there because they wanted to support them. It was just that every time I get asked, who inspires you? I have this general comment. It's not very specific, but I always say the good people who are doing good things to benefit people who they don't even know. There are so many people who have contributed, donated to CAF to help challenge athletes that they will never ever see in their life. That's amazing. Marco, you are the absolute best. It's always so much fun to chat with you. Now, are you trying to become an American citizen? Is that a goal? Oh, Bob, I have been an American citizen for a long time. How long now? How long now? Two years now. It's going to be two years in November. Yeah. So, okay. so that means you could go potentially for 2024, if you decide to go for another Paralympics, you yes. could be an American. Yeah, and my American citizenship came, came with a lot of blessings. It was six days after I ran New York City Marathon that I became an American citizen. I love that. Hey, Marco, thank you so much for taking so much time. I just love your energy and everything you bring for CAF. You're the best. I can't wait to see you go sub 230. Uh, this this journey has been spectacular and thanks for taking me along on the ride thank you for having me bob and you have a good time marco Cicetto has been our guest again he is the world record holder 237 23 for the marathon as a amputee again we're brought to you by pto the pro triathletes organization by Ampuman velofix normatech form swim goggles you can our challenged athletes foundation we've now raised $123 million, sent out 30,000 grants to athletes in all 50 states and 73 countries for 103 different sports. Marco, thank you, buddy. It's always awesome chatting with you.